queen named Herodias ultimately had his head on a silver platter. A lot of parallels between the two. They were both living in the wilderness. Uh, Elijah fled into the wilderness. They discipled people. They worked by the Jordan River. Now, if we're going to talk about John the Baptist and his great ministry, and if we're going to take the statements of what Jesus said and how important they are, what is it that John the Baptist did? Well, what separates him from John the Apostle? He's the Baptist. What do Baptists do? They baptize. John baptized Jesus. It must be important. So we're going to study this subject because when Christ was baptized, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he began a life of ministry. Do you know God baptized his whole nation of Israel? Did you know that? It tells us there in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the whole nation of Israel went through the Red Sea and they were baptized in the sea. And later they were covered with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. They were baptized in the water and in the Spirit. The whole nation. And then the Lord says that we must be born of the water and born of the Spirit. So let's go into our study. I want you to know how important this is. And why was the baptism ministry of John so important? Answer, Jesus speaks to us, last chapter of Mark. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You notice it doesn't say he that is not baptized will be damned because we are not saved by baptism. We're saved by Jesus and by faith. But look at how the Lord did put that big emphasis on he that believes and is baptized will be saved. It's something that he paired together. Furthermore, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and born of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, some have said, born of the water, well, that, that means that, you know, you're in this embryonic fluid before you're born, and so that's the, the human birth, and you need to be born of the water and then born of the Spirit. No, that's not what it's talking about. Jesus is talking about baptism. Why would he say that? Let me ask a question. Let's get an audience reaction here. I'd like to warn our studio. Uh, how many here, just wondering, were born of a woman? <laughs> Why would Jesus say that? Wouldn't that be a little redundant? So when he says born of the water, he's talking about water baptism is your choice. Spirit baptism is God's choice. You know, our world, before it is made new, is baptized in water in the days of Noah, and it'll be baptized in fire when Christ comes again, and then he makes a new earth. If you want a new body, we must be born of the water and born of the Spirit, just like the world. And the last words of Jesus ought to have a high priority with Christians. What did Jesus say as he ascended to heaven? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Go and teach and baptize. It's very important to Jesus. So this is something that we ought to study. It's a priority with Christ. It should be a priority with his people. Now some are thinking, well, if it's that important, aren't there going to be a lot of people in heaven that weren't baptized? What about all those people in the Old Testament? That's true. But it's something that once Christ establishes something as a truth, as an ordinance, then we must embrace it if we're living during these New Testament times. You might be thinking, well, what about the thief on the cross we talked about in our questions? He accepted Jesus. Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. He wasn't baptized. How could he be saved? Or if it's, obviously, it's symbolic. It's not that important. Well, if a person can be baptized, they should be. He couldn't be. Periodically, I'll go visit somebody in the hospital and they're on their deathbed. And I do my best whenever I can to lead a person who hasn't yet made their decision to accept Christ. And I have seen people in their final hours accept Jesus. One brother who was dying of AIDS and is on his deathbed, basically, all these hospital tubes and equipment, asked Jesus into his heart, and I prayed with him, and I hope to see him in the kingdom. He couldn't be baptized. Sometimes in prison, person on death row. Can the Lord forgive someone who's even guilty of murder? Yeah, that's not the unpardonable sin. They've accepted Jesus. They've asked for forgiveness, but the prison, because of security, will not accommodate a baptism. Is baptism to be an obstacle to their salvation? But it, how can they get credit? Why was Jesus baptized? Was he baptized for his sin? No. Christ was baptized for several reasons. One, an example for you and me. I'll talk about that later. 
but Jesus was also baptized as to give credit for those who cannot be. For instance, did Christ die for his sin or for yours and mine? For ours. So the baptism of Jesus certainly inaugurated his ministry, but even more than that, he was an example, but even more than that, Christ, since he was not baptized for his sin, those who can't be baptized because they're on a cross or in a hospital or in a prison, Jesus will give them credit for his baptism. But if you can be and you're not, you're putting aside something Jesus says he commands us to do. Amen? He says this is a priority for believers. James chapter 4, verse 17, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. If you know it's something God asks us to do, we should do it. Number three, there are many ordinances that are called baptism these days. Isn't any one of these acceptable, provided a person is sincere and earnest about it? Does it need to be the biblical method of baptism? What are some of these other ordinances? Well, maybe you've heard, and you've, a lot of churches teach water baptism is just a symbol. What really matters is Holy Spirit baptism. You don't really need water baptism. Others say you can be baptized by pouring oil. It's the same as anointing. They'll pour oil. Some teach you pour salt. Others do rose petals. Some baptize by immersion three times, once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Spirit. Uh, they've got all these different things that they call baptism these days. Some, did I mention the rose petals? That would surprise me sprinkling and pouring and then some people tell evangelists and others they'll say you can get baptized over the phone just call us or touch your tv <laughs> that's what you call the dry cleaning method <laughs> but are, do any of these things are they all valid what did jesus say ephesians chapter 4 verse 5 there is say it with me one lord one faith one baptism now that means there's one baptism one truth we are baptized into one christ but I believe there's one biblical method of baptism. We only find one kind of baptism in the Bible, one type. What does the word baptism even mean? It's coming from a Greek word, baptizo, and that word means to dip, to immerse, to plunge underwater, and to a person to be completely buried in the water. They find that word frequently in ancient Greek literature, the same word you find in the Bible, baptizo, and it was used by the cloth industry when they wanted to dye cloth. It says that they would take a stick and they would plunge the cloth under so it would penetrate every fiber in the cloth, and it was baptizo, the same word. It was immersed in the dye. There's no question about what the word means. Now, if you're in doubt, what is a Christian but a follower of Jesus? Amen? Do what Jesus did and you're always safe. What did Jesus do? How was Jesus baptized? That's our next question. If we follow his example, we know we're on the right track. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Jesus came and was baptized of John in Jordan, and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. He went down into the water. He came up out of the water. And again, you can read Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the round about Jordan, and they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, if sprinkling or pouring is appropriate, did John need a river? Matter of fact, you can read in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 23. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much, what does it say? Much water there. Why did he pick that spot? Because he could fill a canteen and sprinkle people? No, there was much water there and they came and they were baptized. It's very clear in the Bible, everyone who was baptized, they were immersed and it represented a total envelopment of water. And some might be thinking, now, does it really matter, Pastor Doug? I mean, because it's a symbol, and it is, it is a symbol. But do the symbols matter? Who introduced so many of these unbiblical methods of baptism that uh, have become so prevalent and popular? Well, I think we're all suspicious of the answer already. Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus said, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. A lot of these things are just commandments of men. And again, Mark chapter 7, verse 8, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, Jesus said. Christ is telling us we need to stick with the commandments of God. Say amen. Please, thank you very much. Another example, even up to the first century. <clears throat> Here's a picture of a church that was excavated in uh, Philippi from the first century. 
What's the central thing in the church? It's a baptistry that they had right in the middle of the church. A matter of fact, right up till over a thousand years after the beginning of the Christian era,